tardes. Les habla Ramiro Salazar, su director de bibliotecas públicas de la, de la ciudad de San Antonio. Quiero darles a todos ustedes a la bienvenida. Me da mucho gusto que están todos ustedes aquí con nosotros, con nosotros en este programa tan especial. Good afternoon, I'm Ramiro Salazar, I'm the director of the San Antonio Public Library. Uh, I want to extend to all of you a very warm welcome uh, to this uh, program that I've been looking forward to, and, and I trust that all of you have also been looking forward to this program. As part of the San Antonio Public Library's annual uh, celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month, we have put a program today that uh, we trust will enlighten you, will celebrate um, our history, um, major developments, uh, phenomena that happened in the 60s and 70s that changed the landscape in Texas. Uh, and great individuals step forward uh, to talk about the importance and to speak for uh, la raza, Chicanos, Mexicanos, Mexican American. Uh, you'll hear more from our panel uh, about those uh, times and the importance of uh, speaking out, uh, having a voice, uh, the developments in various areas of Chicano culture, the, the arts and letters, um, very important developments and, and contributions happened during that period. And I'm looking forward to listening to the panel to talk more about their personal experience. Uh, but before I do that, I, I want to recognize the special guests that we have here in our audience. Uh, start with uh, Rogelio Sainz, uh, Dean of Public Policy for UTSA. Uh, Neftali de Leon, local artist, muralist, author, activist, and just a plain good individual. Um, well, we're happy to have him here. Charles Contrell, former chancellor of St. Mary's. Um, we were expecting also Dr. Clark from the UTSA Professor Emeritus, uh, Ellen Trujillo Clark to be specific, but I don't see her here yet. She's maybe running late. Um, so again, thank you, and I want to welcome all of our special guests. If I miss someone, uh, my apologies. Um, before I introduce to you the moderator, I want to say a few words. Um, I think libraries have a responsibility to put together this kind of programs to educate and to enlighten the community about important happenings um, in, in our communities, in our history, uh, in the development of uh, politics. <coughs> it's important that the stories be told and that people have an opportunity to learn about that, especially our younger generation uh, that may not know the struggles of the Mexicano and, the, and La Raza uh, during the 60s and 70s, and even today there's still, we have still struggles. Um, so it's important for libraries as democratic institutions to take an active role and we commit to doing that, uh, to continue to bring programs that will enlighten the community and will educate. There are so many uh, misunderstandings and misperceptions about things that happen. Uh, for example, it was communicated to me that an individual contacted the library and said, uh, you have this problem, did you, did you know that La Raza was a hate group? That's totally false, obviously. But there, there continues to be the ignorance, misunderstanding. And so what I, the point I'm trying to make is that libraries uh, will continue to play an important role to educate and to really set the, the facts straight. Uh, it was a struggle, um, and it was a cause, and it was a, an important contribution to, uh, to Texas. And so, so we're happy that we're here today so we can share those stories uh, with you. I also want to take a moment to recognize someone who could not join us today, but I'm sure uh, will be discussed throughout this afternoon, afternoon's discussion, and that's Rosie Castro. We know Rosie today as the, as the mother of arguably Texas' most famous twins, Mayor Julian Castro and Congressman Joaquin Castro. 
but during the 1960s and 70s, Rossi was active, an active defender of the Camarades. He spent many days working with some of the members of our panel and others at, at the Bear County Chair of Arras Unida to encourage voter registration and Chicano and Latino leaders to run for public office so the changes and improvements to the lives of many San Antonians and others would come. At a time, at a time when it was rare for women to do so, she ran for San Antonio City Council as a member of the committee for five years better. Rosie has dedicated her life to public service, and we see that it dropped off in her sons. Although Rosie uh, Castro isn't here today, uh, couldn't live today in class without acknowledging her contributions um, and to thank her for her support of the library. She's one of our biggest supporters and for her contributions to San Antonio. I see Dr. Ellen Clark, Professor Emeritus, has walked in. Welcome. Lastly, I want to acknowledge the staff uh, that organized this program, starting with Joe Banklin, who will be our moderator today. Uh, Joe and his committee, uh, the Celebrate Diversity Committee, put together this program. And so I want to express my appreciation for their hard work and for putting this important program uh, together. So with that, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Joe Wendler. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the San Antonio Public Library. I have a few housekeeping things first before we go on with our, uh, our, our panel. Uh, the, the Celebrate Diversity Committee thrives and flourishes when we get suggestions for programming. It's very important that you fill out the, uh, the customer survey at the end of the, at the program. Tell us what you like about this program. Give us some feedback and, and let us know some other ideas of what you'd like to see at the library. A second thing is this, if this is the first time you've been to the San Antonio Public Library, please make sure to get a library card. That is the best way you can access all the information that we have and extend your experience from this panel a moment in time to um, time afterwards. Um, and also in the back, there, there is an opportunity to buy some of the books that, uh, that, are, that are some of our panelists have, have written and have made available uh, to you. Our theme for the, this year's Hispanic Heritage Month is Palabras con Poder. And our panelists today represent a progression in the pursuit of equality for Chicanos, Latinos, and Hispanic Americans from the beginnings of San Antonio's own journey to the later part of the 20th century and early part of the 21st century. Our conversation will explore words with power. And um, I'd like to introduce to you, on the end, is Veronica Goldbach, the author of Deep in the Heart of High School, a young adult book about three girls who meet in a band and become best friends. Veronica earned her bachelor's degree in humanities and, and then a master's degree in teaching middle grades from Trinity University. She has taught English as a second language at middle and elementary schools in San Antonio and South Central Los Angeles. Uh, Veronica became interested in writing young adult fiction when she was trying to find novels uh, for her seventh grade students that her seventh grade students would enjoy. Edna Campos, Greg, Greg Norse, knew at the age of 12 that she wanted to be a writer. Currently a resident of St. Louis, Missouri, and then her four siblings grew up 60 miles from the Mexican border in Freer, Texas. Children of a father born in Mexico and a mother born in Texas. After studying at South Texas Commercial College, Del Mar College, and Universidad Nacional Autonomia, 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 Edna <laughs> launched a 25-year career on, in sales, merchandising, and marketing. In 1997, she sent a story she had written earlier to the editors of Latina Magazine. One Last Link on Un Cabron was published and Edna finally realized it. Today she divides her time between writing for publication and operating a house history research business. She was a writer in community, she was a writer in communities at San Antonio's Gemini Inc. in fall of 2009 and was a member of the spring 2010 faculty. Mario Copian of San Antonio is a co-founder of La Raza Unida and also co-founded my Mexican-American youth organization while attending St. Mary's University. In 1978, Mario ran for governor as La Raza Unida's candidate. Today, Mario teaches citizenship to immigrants. 
and Dr. Jose Angel Gutierrez, a co-founder also of La Raza Unida, was one of the leading Chicano activists and political leaders in the 1960s, 70s at, at, in Texas. Today, Dr. Gutierrez teaches political science at the University of Texas Arlington while working on his master's degree uh, in government from St. Mary's in San Antonio. He co-founded also Mayo, uh, and Dr. Gutierrez received his bachelor's degree from Texas A&M in Kingsville, then earned his PhD from the University of Texas and his law degree from the University of Houston. Uh, he has uh, mentioned a number of books, uh, including Chicanas in, Chicanas in Charge, Texas Women in the Public Area, We Won't Back Down, Severita Laura's Rise from Student Leader to Mayor. They called me King Tiger, my struggle for the land and our rights and El Politico, the Mexican-American elected officials. Today our conversation will be involving, a, again, a, a broad span of, of this movement here in San Antonio. And um, please welcome our panelists today. That was a question. <laughs> for you. For you. Just let them talk. And certainly feel comfortable to, 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 to talk and to, to share your experiences. This, this is um, really just a conversation and not a lecture. And, um, but please share your experiences about, about the movement and some of your memories and recollections. OK. I'll do that. The first recollection and the first answer to your question is, that you, you, we didn't start off with that. <laughs> we didn't even know how to spell decolonize, <laughs> I'm sure, <laughs> much less what it meant. Uh, as, as we grew up, as I grew up, and, and meeting people like Mario and, and others, you know, Rosie, Grace sitting in the audience, and Fredo, other people, other folks here in the audience, for example, one of the things that we held in common was that, that we shared a frustration, not only with the, the, what we thought was the inactivity on the part of our parents, but also the, the continued pervasive endemic problems that our community faced. And being young, we said, well, we're gonna fix it. Now, the reason we thought that, I think, uh, at least I did, was because I had a, a Mexican uh, revolutionary father, most of us, our grandparents came over during that time, between 1930, uh, and I had a Chicana mother, uh, and both of those generations didn't want to fight. My father kept seeing his future, even though he was already in the 70s, still linked to Mexico. Uh, my mother thought that, well, you know, it's whatever the, the men wanted to do. She had no, no role to play, she was just supporting, and, and she didn't want to fight and upset the apple cart. Knew, knew that I had to learn English and make sure that I did that and stuff. But my generation, you know, we, we would go to school, for example, coming out of our barrios and go to the school. I'm talking about Cristal now. You know, maybe San Antonio is a little different. Uh, we'd walk out of the barrio with the unpaved streets and no sidewalks and, you know, all of that uh, and, and get to the school. And in the school there, at a certain year, by 7, 1957, 58, something like that, uh, we finally were integrated, so we, we saw white students for the first time and sat kind of next to them, you know. And then the bell would ring, and we would uh, go back to the same unpaved streets and no sidewalks. Well, in, in one of the little booklets, not up here on display, but it's over there, uh, I talk about that, me, myself, and I. My generation not only thought we belonged here, we were finishing school, we were getting fairly good grades. We, we knew the, the white history, and we kind of knew that there had to be some history other than the one being told to us about us. Uh, so that void was kind of filled in by my father. 
Uh, he made sure that I was a Mexican. Mexicano hasta las cachas, ya hablas español, y no llores y no pugas, cabrón. You know? So, at home, I had to be Mexican. Uh, my mother you know, would help, and, and at school, I had to be Anglo, you know, to speak without an accent, and enunciate, and, you know, and avoid all the regulars, the like, cherry, la mis, y la chicken, y orale, wey. Leave all that out. But when we were going to school, and after 3.30, when we got to school, we then were ourselves, you know, with, with the Chicanos, the, our peer group. So that me, myself, and I, that, that triumvirate, that three-headed person, was in us. And so, you know, we, we kind of developed our own way of doing things and our own vision of the world. Uh, what meant was that we had to fight. You know, if, if my father wanted to go back to Mexico, uh, and my mother didn't know which way to go as uh, the middle generation, that migrant generation. My generation, not knowing any better, thought that we belonged here. And when you have that notion that this is your home, you fight, you defend. And that's what we did. For that, we got called radicals and all kinds of other things. But that's the way it was. I uh, have a different perspective. Uh, I'm not sure that, that I said, oh, you know, I'm this, I'm that, or the other. I spent a lot of time when I was a kid reflecting on who I was, not because I, I had a lot of time, but because I didn't know what to do. You know, our, my environment, the, the environment I grew up in is just, uh, a mixture in the barrio, the west side barrio of San Antonio, on the one hand, and secondly, growing up in the migrant stream as a migrant farm worker. So my social identity if a, as a Chicano later came out of that experience, has its roots there in that experience. As a migrant farm worker, trabajando los surcos de vía y media de largo, los surcos de algodón, so los surcos de, de otras cosas, pero principalmente el algodón, picking cotton, those long, long roads, I had a lot of time to reflect. Slowly, poco a poco, empujando el, el, el costal, el morral, la saca que otros la llaman, going along, trucking day after day after day in the, in the, the cotton fields of the West Texas, the Lubbock area, in South Texas, the coastal bend, East Texas, Eastern Dallas, all around the state. As a childhood, to about age 10, I spent in the state of Texas. After that, I went off to other states. When I was 10 years old, I went to Colorado. And, and being the only one in the family who spoke English at that age, I was sitting in the back seat of the car with a, the farmer and his wife, and they were driving me to downtown, to a little town, to buy utensils, cooking utensils. And they were having a conversation. And the conversation was in part about uh, what kind of uh, utensils should we get them, and where should, should we get them? And the man said, well, let's go to the, to, the, to the store, the hardware store. And the lady said, no, let's go to the second-hand store. And the guy said, well, why? And she answers, they're only Mexicans. That's one of my first experiences, had knowing that somebody else looked at us in a certain way. My environment as a child, of, as a, growing up in the San Antonio was a closed one. We were segregated. There were nothing. There were no one. There was no one else there but Mexicans. You know, now we can call them Mexicans. But now I know. I know better. But, but it was only us. From the time we got out there, when we came to to the Barcado, to that area for the uh, uh, the uh, <clears throat> the at that time we, uh, they had a farmers market there that produce row had the, the uh, on the one corner of the street the Tato Nacional, then the Zaragoza, and then later the Alameda. So that was the the area that we went to on weekends only. That's, those were my trips out of the barrio. Then, of course, going to other states. And it was my experience going out of the states that kind of started to wake me up and say, look at things, look at things around you, how, what kind of environment there is. And that's how I began to acquire my social identity and later what we, you call a, a, a radical militant identity. It, it, it's not that, it's just that it was a desire to make things better for myself and for others, for my family. That's, you know, what I thought 
you know, I was doing, making things better. I set out to do that because I had experienced that I didn't like it and I wanted to change it. said in Fur, Texas, 60 miles from the Mexican border. Uh, my father, because he had come from Mexico, he was very fearful of ever uh, making any waves. So they would sit us down before we went to school, act a certain way, don't bring attention to yourself as a Mexicano. That was my father's. And, but my mother, because she was born here, she was a lot more vocal about things. And uh, I graduated from Fur High in 73, so I wasn't real close to the movement because we were removed from it because I was in a small town. But the small, my high school, we only had one high school, so we all went to the same school, which was an advantage. They couldn't say segregate us that way, but for some reason, our class, when we would have our meetings, you know, our class meetings, we were segregated. The Mexicanos sat on one side, the uh, Caucasians sat on the other side, and uh, because they were more Caucasians, most of the time they won all the, you know, homecoming queen and all those things. And uh, when I, I already knew that I was identified as less than because as my mother sent us to kindergarten so that we would speak uh, English without an accent because she knew that that would be a disadvantage. I went to kindergarten when I was three years old, and. Uh, my mother took me to enroll me in ballet class because I wanted to be in ballet like, you know, other little girls, but I didn't notice that all the other ballerinas were white. And so when my mother went to enroll me for ballet class, they knew my mother by name, and they told her when she went to register and pay my fee, they said, sorry, Mrs. Campos, we don't accept Mexicans. I was five years old, and at that time, uh, I was different. I was labeled as less than, and then I knew that uh, if I wanted the opportunities that the other kids had, uh, I was going to have to stand up for that. And I was lucky that my mother fought the fight. My mother always fought the fight and went to the school board. Actually, they had to get rid of a teacher that uh, called my brother a dirty Mexican in front of the sixth grade class and then put him in a closet for the rest of the class. So my mother marched up there. She was a member of the PTA. My mother was the second uh, Mexican-American in the Ladies of Silvery, the VFW, in Freer. So I was lucky. My father was always very fearful, don't make waves, because uh, maybe he was afraid of being sent back to Mexico. But, but my mother always did stand up for us, so I was very fortunate. And I'm very fortunate of the movement because that gave us a voice to say it's okay to make waves. I, I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. Veronica, Veronica offers a, a unique perspective. Obviously, she was not part of the 60s and 70s movement. Uh, but uh, would you please tell us your experiences of some of the results of, 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 of these movements? Um, at first, I was really hesitant to be part of this panel. I think, you know, they, if they had asked my mom to be part of this panel, she could really tell you what it was like growing up and not being able to speak Spanish in school and hiding in the bathroom to play jacks. My mom was a part of the movement. Um, she was one of the first bilingual education teachers at her school, and she would go to all the conferences, and she's very, very involved. Um, even my sister, my sister's very involved in, you know, cultural identities, things. She just got a, a grant from El Centro de la Raza or something to study. Um, she's doing her thesis on flamenco under Franco in Spain. So my sister's lived in Mexico, she's lived in Spain, she's lived all over but me. <laughs> you know, I'm just um, a half and half with the wrong last name. You know, I'm not really, I didn't really think I could relate to it, but in preparing for this, I've talked a lot to my mother and my sister and thought about, I do have a different perspective on ethnic identity. Ethnic identity is something I feel very insecure about. Um, I, uh, like I said, my mother was part of the movement, and um, my father didn't speak Spanish. Um, you know, he was, he's adopted. He was adopted by um, people from New York, so he didn't speak any Spanish. So my mom didn't teach us Spanish at home, really. 
you know? Why would you speak something that your dad couldn't understand? And uh, my sister spent a lot of time with my grandmother, uh, and my grandmother spoke mostly Spanish. My grandmother did not like to uh, babysit me because I was a very active baby. My sister was the kind of baby that could sit and watch soap operas, and so my grandmother just loved her. <laughs> and so she spent a lot of time there. And I spent more time with my dad. He worked nights, so he watched me during the day. And um, we, were very we were very close to my mom's side of the family, again, because my dad was adopted, so there was always this sort of distance there. Um, and just looking at the way my identity developed versus my sister's identity, um, I think there was a huge difference in us. My sister went to private school. She went to St. Paul's, she went to Incarnate Word, she graduated from Incarnate Word, then she went to UT Austin. And my sister has always thought being, has always been more ethnic than I am. I went to um, Tafoya Middle School, I went to Brackenridge High School, and the lovely and amazing, my best friend Denise Cadena Lopez is here. Um, and there, we can kind of see the wake of what's happened with the um, activism. There it is very, very cool to be Hispanic. It is very cool to be ethnic. But it is not quite so cool to try to be ethnic if your last name is Goldbach. So um, I kind of have, a, I kind of shied away from my ethnicity. I was just like, yeah, my, my name. I'm, I'm, I wouldn't try to be, you know, try to hang out with the really Hispanic people. Except for Denise, because she's awesome. You know, most of them did not accept me. So just okay. So I would, I had a lot of the culture because my mom raised us. Um, my dad died. Um, she had us in um, dance class from the time I was five. I did ballet too, but I got kicked out because I didn't have the right body type enough for it. <laughs> but um, we were in um, Mexican folkloric, uh, flamenco, classical Spanish dance from the time I was five years old on. And, um, so I had a, a lot of the culture, but I, didn't have the, I don't have the name. So uh, I kind of shied away from it. My sister, who was at private school, I guess had a, there was a different environment there. So she was, you know, very ethnic. And she went on to UT, and she would call my mom up there. You know, when we would go to visit, she'd show off my mom, because my mom looks ethnic. And, um, you know, she became very fluent in Spanish. And uh, like I said, she's very involved in the dance scene. And uh, she's majoring in dance history. She's going to. She's my older sister, she went back to school. Um, but I didn't. You know, I kind of, once I broke my collarbone for the third time, I kind of dropped out of dance and um, just kind of started writing. <laughs> and um, so that's, it's only recently since I've written the book that I've come to realize that I do have something to say when it comes to cultural identity. In fact, right before I came here, I was at McDonald's with my mom eating, and very unhealthy. Part of the reason we have the right body type for ballet. But um, a lady who I hadn't seen in forever, who I don't know very well, just happened to have read my book, and she made a comment that, you know, I don't understand how you could get the, um, the viewpoint right, the, the culturalness right that you had in your book, because I have, um, you know, a Hispanic character, and I have a half city like me, and um, a lot of the issues that they deal with, and she's just like, I don't get how you could do that because you're not Hispanic. So my mom's like, yes, she is. <laughs> so I have, uh, you know, a different experience, and um, I'm very fortunate to have this experience that you guys were so very successful, and there is still a lot that needs to happen. I teach it. I taught ESL at Irving Middle School, and I teach in Irving Elementary, SAISD, and I, there is still a long, long way to go for equality, but um, this is my viewpoint, the viewpoint of the um, culturally quiet, culturally um, insecure, Half seat. And I, I know there are more of us out there that are half and half with the wrong last name that are still, that still should feel involved and still feel part of the Hispanic identity in San Antonio. I think identity is, is something that we need to, to talk about. And um, um, in your own experiences, each one of you, we talk about, about what words, what words do you prefer to describe the community? Like, like we, we heard but earlier today of Latino, Hispanic, Chicano. Um, what are the words that you prefer? Especially if we're going to talk about words with power, these are very powerful ways to describe ourselves. Um, someone asked me about my own heritage, and I, I, I'm Filipino American. I do consider myself Hispanic because that was a colony of Spain, but I don't consider myself Latino, or, and I certainly can't consider myself Chicano. But what are the words that you describe yourselves? Um, Dr. Gutierrez, would you please uh, start that conversation? 
I, I still call myself Chicano, uh, but I also know that this, this is a very complex question because, first of all, as we've already told our experiences, depending on the context and depending on the language, if we're asked in English, what we are, what are you? We will answer, you know, the current term in vogue. <laughs> Uh, and the current one is Hispanic, since Directive 15 out of the Office of Management and Budget uh, issued that word, the official word. And if we're asked in Spanish, we have a different answer. <coughs> and then, depending on our age, you know, the, the, the more we look like old white guys, the more Chicano we are. <laughs> but nobody will believe that. Nobody will believe that uh, now. So, so it's generational as well. Uh, now, the important thing about being Chicano is what I said a minute ago about being a fighter, fighting back and thinking you belong. You have this assertiveness, you have this attitude of can do and must do. Uh, you know, we, we, we also rejected the uh, Anglo assimilation uh, in some of the speeches that you didn't ask me to give. Uh, <laughs> I, I used to use the, the, the gestures and the metaphor that you know, the white people don't like us and the Mexicans don't like us either, so we have to learn to like ourselves. Well, that's a sub Chicano. You know, where we said, you know, we don't have to apologize to anybody. And if they got a problem, they got a problem. We don't have a problem. You don't like the way I talk, you change the way you talk. You, know? you don't like what I eat, don't eat it. You don't like to dance this way, well, no, I live. You know? We have our own identity, we have our own sphere, we created our own space, we created our own self-respect, and our own terminology, because this was a liberating word. Yeah, you know, that's um, kind of a, a, a road we don't want to visit, we don't want a place we don't want to go to. Because, uh, there are better things to do than to, to, to get hung up and say, yeah, well, I'm this, I'm that, I'm the other. And you know, the, the term uh, uh, that Josefa just used, can do. I would rather do than spend myself, spend a lot of time, you know, arguing about who I am or who, who you know, why you, you call this or that. But to reemphasize what Josefa just said is this, that uh, in a political world, as political activists, we know that there's work to be done. So the more time we waste arguing in meaningless, uh, 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 getting hung up in meaningless situations, the less time we have for organizing, for doing the work that needs to be done. And right now, for whatever, for better or for worse, the, the term that publicly is used is Latino. I'm not gonna argue with anyone about that because I know that now my experience, the work that we did, and since then, we know, and I know, that we, those of us who were involved in the movement, and I, we are still Chicanos. That is the identity that I, that I reached once I went through a time of my period of reflection. It, it uh, coalesced with, with uh, coincided rather with the, uh, the uh, national movements that were going on, and that we are now having our own identity, and that is Chicago, and it's still Chicago. Uh, yes, in Texas I do law. I always use this term Chicana because people know what that means. Uh, I live in St. Louis, but before I went to St. Louis, I was in Indiana, Illinois, and Missouri. And so I still fight the, I fight a daily fight, but there it's as uh, Latina. And uh, I have people get in my face more than I would care to count in the Midwest because we're in the center of the country. And so when I moved to the Midwest from Texas, we're totally accepting because I moved from San Antonio. And to, uh, the fight that you guys fought in the 60s and I was part of in the 70s, that fight is still going on in the central part of the country. And so um, I, I seem to be fighting that battle almost every day. But I choose it as a way to educate. Uh, I married a Caucasian. So as I said, I started educating my in-laws first. The proper way to approach people is not get in my face and ask me, what are you? Because if you ask me, what are you? I said, first of all, I am of the human race. And in Illinois, I actually went as far as to tell a farmer who was trying to make me feel like, what was I doing there? I didn't belong, who got in my face and said, what are you? 
I said, well, first, I am human. I said, I am an American. And he says, no, I'm asking you, where were you born? You know, like the Cheech and Chong thing. And I'm like, I was born in Texas. Is that a foreign country to you? So, I mean, I try to be respectful of people, but I like what the blues singer uh, Kim Massey says. I am a lady by choice, a bitch on demand. And I don't like to go there, but sometimes I want to go there. But I think that your experience is, is between the states, between California and Texas. What are some of the contrasts and the differences that you've seen in the, the Chicano or Latino community uh, of those two, two locations? Well, I was just going to say a little bit about the words first, and then that kind of goes with it. Um, as far as putting a, a name on what you are, what, which word to pick, um, in my generation, at least the people I've been around, it, Chicano? tends to be more like you're very politically active, you were part of that movement, you're just very, I don't know, it just makes me, growing up I thought that was more like the people in California, the people that are fighting. Um, Latina, I did not really feel comfortable with until I saw Alexis Bledel, I don't know if you guys know who she is, she was on Gilmore Girls, she was on the cover of Latina magazine. And sometimes when I'm really, really, really thin, people tell me I look like her. And so when I saw that, I was like, oh, if she can come out and be on the cover saying she's Latina and her last name is Liddell and she's just as white as I am, maybe I could be Latina too. But mostly, um, I have my cousin who is the same Mex I am. She calls herself Mexican, <coughs> but I just don't feel, I don't know, it feels, it feels kind of odd. It feels like you're just throwing that word out there. I, I settle for Hispanic because it's just nice and warm and fuzzy and <laughs> it embraces everybody. Um, as far as the cultures uh, between states, when I lived in California, I lived um, right when they were having all those uh, immigration protests and everything. And I was teaching in South Central, and there the community was more Salvadorian uh, immigrants. So it was quite different from my experience at Tafoya and at Brack and at Teaching and Irving, where they're mostly from Mexico. Um, but, you know, I didn't really see a difference really that much in the, I mean, I mostly worked with kids, the second grade, it was wonderful. Uh, it was a difference in the neighborhood, you know. They would, had a big giant fence that they would lock when school started, and they would unlock it when school ended, and um, we would have open house at two in the afternoon, because the teachers didn't want to go, you know, there at night, and you got paid an extra stipend for urban, I forget how they phrased it, for teaching in a dangerous area. Um, but, you know, I never encountered any of that in elementary school. I know the kids were, were really into it. They thought um, that they were having parades when they would have the immigration protests. I think the May 1st was, it was that year, it was 2005, 2006. Um, I forget when they had the big protests in LA. It must have been 2006, if that's when I was there. And they said, oh yeah, we went to the parade. And they were really into si se puede. So when something didn't work, like my CD player wasn't working and I was trying to put something on for them, they all started chanting, si se puede, si se puede. <laughs> so it would work, but I hadn't found that, you know, in San Antonio, but you know, it's not the same time. It was a very charged time for the kids. Okay, Gutierrez, could you please tell us about um, organizing La Casa Unida and, and um, the Mexican American youth organization and, and some of your regulations on the kids in the early days? Wow, I, I think I'll split that up with Mario. Uh, okay. <laughs> the story of Mario, well, the book is up here uh, somewhere. Anyway, uh, I'll stick to the, the Raza Vida. That was a nightmare uh, in several fronts. First, you know, we don't have a political party or two in the United States. We have over a hundred because each state <laughs> regulates political parties. So you multiply the number of states that we have and, and then the number of groups that are active within that state and you've got a multiplicity. And all the states regulate. There, there is no national election code. There is a Texas election code and there's one for every state. And it tells you how you form a party, uh, like a recipe. And like a recipe, you know, it takes practice. <laughs> if you follow the recipe even exactly the way it is, it's not going to come out the way you saw it on the picture or the way you tasted it at a restaurant. 
<laughs> uh, well, this is a very expensive proposition, practice at trying to organize a political party. But this is exactly what, what happened to us. We read the book uh, and we began following the recipe to gather X number of signatures uh, in a regional area. We started off as trying to organize a regional party. Uh, you may recall that George Wallace ran under the American Party in, uh, in 68 and did well. And so that was the genesis of the idea that, well, hell, you know, if these guys can do that, you know, with their brand of politics, we can also, and we should. Now, there was one Chicano who ran under the American Party in Zavala County, my home county, for sheriff, Juan Cornejo. Uh, and and uh, there were some people in the, in the valley, the Farm Workers Union, that wanted to toy with that, but they didn't run. So that, that's where the idea came, and we so said, we can do this too. It started. The recipe for a regional party is different than a statewide party. And this is where the, the, the nightmare and headaches began. We did well in terms of running candidates for nonpartisan office in the rural area. We ran 16 candidates and won 15, first time out of the, the shoot. Well, that immediately ignited the interest among others. And others, I mean statewide. And so we began then trying to get away from the regional party to organize the state party. And, and the government of Texas helped us in that decision. They outlawed our regional party. Uh, we went to court, and, and I think the, the decision is here on record at the federal building, not far from here. Uh, Adrian Spears was the, the judge uh, who, who gave this decision. Uh, he said that we were not being discriminated but not being allowed on the ballot because we exhausted the state remedies and then moved over to federal court. He said that uh, we did not exhaust uh, all the remedies because we still could vote against the Democratic Party. <laughs> so, so then we, we knew that this was not going to work, uh, the, the regional aspect. And, and it was up to county judges to determine whether you got on the ballot in that county or not. Some put us on the ballot, some did not. Then we went into the larger picture. Uh, and that's where, again, the rules went against our, our desires. The rules in the party are allocated by the, the last votes cast for a gubernatorial election. So that determined how many signatures we had to get. And I think it was 36,000 or 38,000 signatures. Notarized. Uh, notarized means individually notarized. <laughs> you can't get a blanket piece of paper and say, here, sign it. You had to have the, the voter ID number. Nobody knows their voter ID number. Now you can look it up immediately, you know, through, through the databases that are digitized. <laughs> Back then, we couldn't even become deputy registrars. <laughs> so th this was horrendous. Uh, and I remember that we used to have even all night parties to try to get people to sign uh, these petitions to, to, to get the ballot status. And we were asking people like, like yourselves, sign my petition so that we can form a party. And you would ask, well, who's running? Well, we don't know yet. We don't have the party. <laughs> well, will I be able to vote in the primary? No, no, you can't. You have to wait till November. So uh, I'm throwing away my, my vote. I'm not going to be able to vote. You don't know who you're going to run. That's right. Trust me. <laughs> Sign here. <laughs> and then, you know, we, we had the, the, the stereotypes, you know, the attitude. That we're born Catholic and Democrat. Uh, people can't. And, and ultimately, that's what broke Willie away from, from the rest of the other four of us in, in Mayo. Uh, he was really, you know, a uh, uh, hueso colorado democrat because of his parents and all that. And he just, he just couldn't swallow the rest of the business. Okay, he did buy the world registration thing, as you know. <laughs> so, you know, we had to, to labor with the rules, and we had to labor with the attitudes, and we had to labor with the resources. One last anecdote, we, we did get the, the money, uh, and, and this is funny, because Mario and I went. We took the boxes of the petition, and uh, Bob Bullock was the Secretary of State. And in the rules, it says you have to deliver them to him. So we went, we already knew about the gringo tricks, so and there's a book about that over there too. Uh, we went, and we wouldn't release the boxes. They wanted us to leave them there. We said, no, 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 we want to see Bullock. You know, estamos, no nos vamos. So we waited quite a while, then finally, you know, he came out all flustered. This is when Bob Bullock smoked and drank. Uh, and, and he had a, a, a mouth that was worse than mine, okay? 
So he comes out all upset, you know, what the hell are we doing? And just bothering and waiting. He said, well, the rule, the election clause says we've got to deliver the boxes with the delivery bill. And, you know, he said, what is this? So we want to get on the ballot. So he picks one up and looks at it and says, what's this bullshit about this Ratsa Unida? Unida. <laughs> <laughs> He said, well, God damn it, it's got to be in, in English. And, you know, Mario and I looked at each other and said, like, what do we say here? So I, I said to him, it is in English. He said, oh, bullshit. You know, <laughs> this, is, this is not English. And so I didn't know what else to say. And I said, well, what's your name? And oh, man, he explained. He said, God damn it, you know what my fucking name is. It's on the door, God damn it. I'm not like everything on my blood. And I, I'm, I'm kind of imitating, but it was a more raspy because he smoked a lot and drank, and, you know, he could. <laughs> so when he, he said, <laughs> my God, man, it's my blood. And I said, well, what is it in Spanish? He said, Babala, come in. I said, well, what's that you need in English? What's that you need the same thing? <laughs> to his credit, to his credit, you know, he, he found me, look, he said, hot damn, that's a good one. Yeah, you're okay, you're going to get on the ballot. <laughs> <laughs> as simple as that. <laughs> now, we did have some other problems, uh, you know, later, uh, ballot security, all of these things, and resources, last, last thing. Uh, in, in Las Vegas, New Mexico, when they were also trying to, to start this, we got the, our entire rest of the chapter and immediately got arrested by the sheriff there because they alleged that we were doing drugs and so on. So a lot of our resources had to go there to defend that effort and we were able not only to, to find all of them innocent but also indict and convict the sheriff of planting the drugs. Oh. But since he was a good Democrat, he came out of prison later and became a state senator. And <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, it depends. Uh, and that's what's happened to us, too. We lost more battle, battles at the courthouse than at the ballot box. And in some counties, like Nurses County, they, would, they indicted the entire group of people that voted for the rest of the party in places like Ondo, Pierso, right on the city. They would fire them and charge them with crimes before the election, make them lose. Uh, we, we got some people beat up and murdered. And, you know, we, some, some people got framed for things they didn't do, et cetera, et cetera. It was, it was a lot of fun. And then we did the National Party. Uh, because everybody else wanted to do the rest of the party. Here, we say, no, let's take the courthouse. <laughs> no, let's take Austin. No, let's take Washington. <laughs> so, so it was basically an exercise in, in futility trying to, you know, to harness this energy nationwide. And, and uh, it, it became impossible. In the and, national context. Did you International? Feel, yeah. Did, did you feel a, a, a competition or a, a, a collaboration with, say, the other civil rights movements that were going on with, like, for example, the, the Black Panthers and the African American movements? Um, did, you, did you feel like you were in competition or, or, or co-working with them? No. Uh, in, in my experience, the, the Black experience had nothing to do with anything that, that, that we did. Now, perhaps people out of Houston, like Tachi Mindiola, the organizer, El Cano, and a few other people, maybe here in San Antonio, maybe a little bit. But no, the, the blacks joined us. In fact, we had a candidate in the rest of the party, uh, two of them, and, and others. You know, so it was the other way around. So no, that, that, that had no influence. Now, the international connection, we started that as Maya. We went to China, went to Lebanon, went to Quebec, we went to Mexico, all over the place. And it continued later. I mean, as as Russell the party, we did go to Cuba in 1975, for example, uh, and, and other trips. So we did internationalize uh, the Chicano movement a great deal, but not as much as Reyes Tijerina had done before, or the level that Cesar Chavez did. You know, he became a household word in Europe because of the boycotts and all of that stuff. But you know, we added our little granito to to that. Uh, but anyway, maybe he wants to do Mayo here. <laughs> Well, this point where I started, the, uh, the point that I want to address, though, is, is um, the, a, a lot of times uh, reporters, uh, academics make statements that say uh, if there hadn't been a, a black civil rights movement, there would have been no Chicano movement. And that's as south of all as can be and more so for an academic state, you know, that. 
because uh, it ignores the history that we have as a people, a history of struggle. You know that the, the Alamo is a relic to a history that took place that began in, in 1836. You have what's called, what is called the, the Battle of the Alamo. Ten years later, the first resistance movement emerges against that, that, that history. That is, Vicente Cordova rose up, organized an army, then he didn't get anywhere, but the fact that, that's a historical fact there. Then, another ten years later, we have the guerrilla movement that lasted almost half a century by Juan Cortina in South Texas. So you have organized resistance against the U.S. occupation of Texas. So to say that the Chicano experience, the Chicano movement is only there because of the black movement ignores that history that we have struggled before, a history of struggle. So therefore, <clears throat> yes, we, uh, we interacted with, with the uh, <coughs> groups in the uh, African-American movement, the black civil rights movement, but we did it because we, we saw it as advantageous, as a need to establish contact, as a need to, to uh, have a viable strategy, not only to change things, but to do so with other groups that had similar interests and in that alliance, coalition, if you want, be able to achieve more. What was the goal? Is to change this country. Not just Texas, not just San Antonio, but the whole country. And that type of strategy said, if we do it, we, we establish contact with these groups, then we might get somewhere faster. And I, have a, I have a different question for you. Um, as a writer, I'd like to ask about your work and about so, so you're, committed you're committed to making sure stories of Latinos and people of color are included. Um, um, you are, are a storyteller and you've chosen to focus on stories of working class Americans. Can you tell us why it's important to write these stories and to tell these stories? Why well, it's important uh, for what I just stated, but uh, I think it's, it's really necessary that we pass these stories on to our next you know, coming generations. Many uh, of the children and grandchildren of the activist Chicano movement are active, but a lot are. Many others are not. And when we're promoting this idea of, of uh, some, not we, are promoting this idea of pan-Hispanic uh, 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 type of, of future, that, that uh, annihilates the, the, uh, that destroys the, the individual identities that people acquire in their own cultures. And it is important that as the work that we did, we talked earlier about the Chicano identity. It's important that we pass that on to, uh, to our kids and our grandkids. It's important that that is present in the, in the curriculum in schools. Those that are in the academy, we know we have a Chicano studies uh, curriculum, a program here and there, and a lot of campuses uh, universities in, over the country. And there are Latino studies and so on, African American studies. And it is through those, through, through those uh, instruments of, of change that can be used rather as instruments of change by making sure that the curriculum passes on this educational uh, experience, this history to our, our coming generations. Uh, I would like for that to be there forever. What comes after, after now and the next uh, uh, century? Well, that's obviously that's going to be a difficult question to answer right now. But if we keep, if we persist on having that curriculum in the schools, not, not just at the university, but K-12 as well, then we can be able to preserve this memory. Historical memory is very important. Um, one of the, the leading uh, mentors of the Chicano movement, Dr. Rodolfo Acuña, recently stated in a piece that he wrote, uh, he was talking about, he was commenting on the, the current situation in Libya. And he states, uh, he goes back to, 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 to the history of the Cuban Revolution, when uh, at some point Malcolm X was, was ex asked to, uh, 
to comment about the Kennedy assassination. And uh, Malcolm says, uh, well, the chickens are, are coming home to roost. And uh, Dr. Acuna writes in that piece, that's what's happening now in Libya, that the chickens are coming home to roost. What does that mean? What do they mean by that? It is the history of U.S. foreign policy that has created these situations in other parts of the world that we're having to placate through the use of force, military, U.S. military might. The chickens are coming home to roost. Ironically, someone else, very contemporary person, said that too about the Libyan situation. Ron Paul. <laughs> Ron Paul says, you know, the chickens are coming home to roost. The situation in Libya is there not because you know, uh, <clears throat> the, the leader used gas, but because of the past history of U.S. foreign policy. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, let, let's talk about the stories again and, 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 and extend it further. So, Edna, you, you, again, you write about uh, working class Americans. Why do you think these stories are important to, to, to write about and to fiction? Because we are the masses, and because there has been so much written about famous people, people with a lot of money, there has not been enough written about working class Americans as Chicanos, as Mexican Americans. Uh, I live in St. Louis. My work is, I am a historical researcher. And as a historical researcher, when I go to the libraries and the historical societies to uh, get information, there's very little there because, for one thing, like all of us, how many of you guys have actually donated photographs and information to our museums and libraries here in San Antonio? And so we complain after the fact and we say, well, this professor wrote this book, Texas History Book, and we got left out as a people, or this. The thing is, is that I know as a writer, is that I'm not going to be able to go around the barrio or the ranches and knock on people's door and go through cattle bars and all that and say, do you have any pictures I can use for my book? Do you have any information? I have to rely on the libraries. And uh, Tom Shelton is here from the Texas Institute. And uh, Tom helped me a lot because he helped me get 40 pictures of Mexican-American cowboys from my family's archives into the library. There's very few pictures there. So when, when uh, professors come to write the textbooks and they're looking for these, they're very difficult to locate. So the reason that I uh, write stories about working class Americans, first of all, that is where I come from. And uh, as I say, for me, I believe that we haven't recorded enough of our history. And then it's like we complain after the fact, like when uh, Ken Burns, you know, did the World War II documentary and the Native Americans and the Mexican Americans were left out. Then, you know, we did get behind that and got them added at the very end. I felt like we weren't showing in a good light as Mexican Americans. I, as a writer and as an American citizen, as a Mexican American, as a Chicana, as a Latina, I think it is our responsibility to write our stories in our voice. When we let somebody else tell our history, el sentimiento, the sentiment, is not going to be there because we all remember our histories different. It depends on how it affected you. Uh, out of five of us in my family, I am the activist in the family. I am the one who constantly is standing up and fighting for the cause. Why? Because soy morena. I'm dark complected and I have kinky black hair. And so my experience on the playground was different from my siblings who were lighter skinned and have straight hair. You see, they didn't have the name Colin and everything else. So, as I say, I believe these stories, just to give you an example, in Amica, why do you want to be an engineer? I was asked to speak at the Science Center in St. Louis for Hispanic Heritage Month. And I said, my stories from Tere Canela talk about a lot of hard things that people don't want to talk about. What am I going to say? So I thought I'll do an essay, and I Googled Latina engineers in the US. 
How many out of 1.34 million working engineers in 2006, less than 1% were Latin women? And so to me, I know it's like, who are these women? We should celebrate them. We should tell their stories. With this little book, I have gone around the country, and it is wonderful for me to be able to go into the barrio, go into the ghetto schools, and talk about these engineers because then children say, si se puede, I can get there too. And then one of the doctors that I featured in Amica, why you want to be an engineer, asked me, Edna, why are you telling our stories when we were young, our struggles? Why don't you tell them now, you know, what we have accomplished? And I said, Dr. So-and-so, if I do that, then the kid in the barrio is going to say, She's got a PhD, or he's got a PhD, like Jose Hernandez, who is an astronaut. They're going to say, that will never be me. But if I tell them where you came from, the barrios and the ghettos, and then they see you there, and now you've got a PhD, and your professor, or you know, you've got your master's, or you're an astronaut, or whatever, then we are telling our children that can be you when you grow up. Of course, we're going to have to do this through education. So that is why I want to make sure that our stories are told in our voice and from our point of view and not from another group telling our stories because if, when we give them that responsibility, it's never going to be right. So uh, it is our responsibility. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning the library.